I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a, and a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. Welcome to The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. As an author, ad man and theologian, I've always been interested in people's stories. Not just those with a high profile, but people from all walks of life, regardless of fame. Which is why I created this show. Each guest who takes the Five of My Life challenge chooses a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. It's amazing what you can learn when discussing someone's five choices. I hope you enjoy listening to the show as much as I enjoy making it. Emile Sherman is an Oscar-winning film producer. The King's Speech, Power of the Dog, Lion and Rabbit Proof Fence are some of his well-known productions. A thoughtful character, it was fascinating hearing his response to the Five of My Life challenge. Emile Sherman, welcome to Five of My Life. Thank you very much. Now, we were talking, uh, Brian Keenan, do you uh, know who Brian Keenan is? I don't think I do. I can see in your eyes that you want to think I you do. I feel like I do, but yeah. I don't. So he, an amazing chap who was the hostage in Lebanon. Right. Five years tied to a radiator, poor bastard. Oh, right. Solitary. Okay. Con- oh, my oh, goodness. My God. So we, uh, I, I, he was so generous, uh, just incredible. He came on and shared his five on five of my life. And I researched and researched, and he's a gentle, intelligent man. And I fucked up the recording. Oh. And I can't, I just can't bring myself to say, can we do it again? I mean, I just, I, I just want to. Yeah, I'm an earthworm. Anyway, so that's why we've just been checking all the wires, mate. Because I would hate to do a Brian on a meal. Because you are a rock star, Oscar-winning producer. Holy crap! Were you there in the room when uh, Will clocked or whatever he's called, Mister Rock? I was. I was. <laughs> it was quite the moment. Did, and did you, did you know when he did it that it was the moment, or did you just think, oh, that's a bit of a kerfuffle, or do you think I've just witnessed a global incident? It was like just sort of cards falling. While well, the first card was, what, what's happening? Then it's like, that was really weird. And then slowly you just realised that something really profound had happened. It felt like there was violence in the room. But you, because it took a while to realise it was a slap, not a punch, it sort of looked like a punch, but he didn't respond exactly like a punch. So it was all surreal. And then there was the yelling and the, the look to the wife. And we were just trying to put it together in real time. But... What was different, I think, from watching it on television was just the palpable sense of of violence. It felt really uncomfortable, like something bad had happened. And, you know, uh, for better or worse, or really for better, you know, I'm not in a world now where I see too many people getting whacked in the head and you're not used to it. Yeah. Thankfully, we live in a country where that's not, not you know, daily occurrence when you walk down the street. Yeah. Gosh, how amazing. Anyway, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about your five, and uh, not just because you are who you are. Uh, we always start with the film, mate. And you have chosen uh, your film on five of my life. I can see the terror in your eyes because you might have even forgotten it, but I've <laughs> been watching it. Uh, Once Upon a Time in the West, Sergio Leone's 1968 classic. Explain yourself. Well, it was really the first film that came to mind, and that is a really strange answer, but I sometimes... Follow the lead on that. I'm not a real list person who have my top whatevers. And so this came to mind. I thought, well, that's a bit weird. I haven't thought about that film for a long time. I thought, well, I'm just going to go with it. Because it was a film that really stuck with me. I watched it a number of times. I don't always watch films multiple times. How old when you first saw it? I would have been in my early 20s. So that's a sort of moment where things really stick. But I think what struck me were two things. One 
is that it was more than the story. It was something operatic, something mythic, something poetic, something very cinematic about it, where you just fell into a trance and you, or I certainly felt like the plot and the length stopped being relevant. It was, I'd given myself over to the film. And I realized that that was because I was in the hands of a director who was extraordinary and created a feeling a poetic feeling and I think that's something at Seesaw Films, my, my television and film company um, that I started a number of years ago with Ian Canning, my partner, that we've been drawn to directors who have some cinema to them, whether it's for the small screen television streamers, whether it's for the big screen or not, but the beauty of cinema where it's plot as well as a sort of experience of transcendence. I love, I love hearing you talk because that, I mean, I hadn't seen it before. And, and uh, I, you know, to be honest, I wouldn't have watched it if you hadn't chosen it. I mean, yeah. That's, yeah. That's part of the joy of doing this podcast. And I could feel what you have just said, mm. at me transitioning. Mm. So, so uh, you know, full disclosure, sort of 10 minutes in, no music, slow pace. I'm thinking, oh, bloody hell of me. I mean, give me, yes. give me a break. Wanker. Uh, film wanker. <laughs> and then at the end of it, I thought... Wow, I don't yeah. know why, but but wow, yeah. and, and and what a car and that the lady, what she called Claudia Cardinale. I'd never yeah. seen her before, but that that's almost illegal. She was yeah. leaping out of the screen yeah. with just sort of radiance, but Bronson and Fonda against um type. Yeah, isn't that so? There's just and and the music, Ennio Morricone. Whoa. Yeah, and as I think you'd said in an email to me, the gender politics doesn't hold up <laughs> to today's standards. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it wasn't about that. And the music is obviously Ennio Morricone goes so far to to sort of realize that so that poetic feeling. But the other thing, Nigel, that I was interested in when I thought, well, I wonder why I chose that movie is that we're in a time now in the sort of world of culture, which a great moment where people who whose stories haven't been told, who haven't been given a chance to tell their stories, have been given a chance. Whether we talk about all range of marginalized groups, whether it's race and ethnicity and sexuality and and it's just a great moment to hear stories from the people themselves. At the same time, what's interesting about this film is it's sort of the opposite. It's an outsider telling, an outsider being Sergio Leone, an Italian director, not only telling the story of America's foundation, the, the sort of the story of the West, but almost creating it. He's part of the creation of the American West. And I really love that idea of the outsider at times being able to have an insight into the insider's culture in a way that's profound. And, you know, uh, I ended up on on the podcast of my own, which which no doubt we'll talk about at some point, but doing an episode on cultural appropriation, which is something I, I confront daily in, in, in my work as, as a film and TV maker. So, so I mean, I, I find that topic, uh, and we're not controversial in Five My Life, but I, I find yeah. that topic absolutely fascinating because taken to its logical extent, mm. you could only do autobiography. So, so you can't do, a, I, I'm, Church of England, lapsed Church of England. Yeah. You're Jewish, so, so you, yeah. you've got no right to do a film about I me. Mean, yeah. Not that you want to, a, a film about me. And you go, well, that's rubbish. I mean, that's absolute rubbish. But you can take it to absurd extremes mm. where, 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 I mean, I'm cisgender, heterosexual, so I'm probably not the best person to talk about mm. LGBTQI. Mm. I, mean, I, I, mean, I mean, but if I was an incredibly brilliant actor, and, and mm. you, you know, so I think uh, it's really important that creators are forced to think about it and in the past you might just not have had to i think that's right being paused having to think you know power relations are key to this idea of cultural appropriation and the issue a lot of people have with it and making sure that people who've been oppressed and not sort of have, don't have their stories taken from them at the same time we need to balance that with our industry the creative industry which is about that beautiful um, imagining into lives of other people. And that's such a powerful thing. It's what we all get up for in the creative industries. Um, so we want to balance those two things. And I have got a podcast called um, Principle of Charity, which tries to bring two people, uh, two experts with, with opposing views on key social issues and to sort of approach some of these controversial issues with curiosity, with generosity, um, and recognizing that to have a view, you actually need to understand the best version of the other viewpoint so on this episode, yeah, we, we looked at the very complex issue of cultural appropriation and had two people on, both motivated. The key is you don't want someone who comes in who doesn't, you know, give a, give a toss. Yeah. 
but people who are motivated by goodwill, by trying to improve society, but who have different opinions and come to different conclusions. And how did that episode go? I listened to the fabulous um, Assisted Dine one. Uh, how, how did you end up with the cultural appropriation? Were you swayed? I would say that I was slightly. I think I come from, I'm in a generation where creativity trumps these yep. things. And I think the challenge from some of the groups saying, hold on a second, there need to be boundaries to creativity, particularly when you're when you're looking to take stories that might be from people who haven't had a chance to express them fully. And and so the, the all the topics I come up with are things that I'm personally just interested in. I don't know the answer. I don't profess to know the answer. For me, the answer is investigating more fully and being open to good faith arguments from both sides. Well, well I, I have to say that your podcast, The Principle of Charity, is... It's a sensation and it's making the world slightly nicer. I, I've just published a book and uh, in it I rant about our inability to have any nuanced debate because that is what we need. There are millions mm. of nice, intelligent, compassionate Trump supporters. Yeah. Now, that should be an, an, ob well, obviously that should are, be an obvious cause, statement. Because there's like 80 million people, whatever. But, but even to say that amongst some of my friendship groups mm. everyone would have burst into tears mm. and you go oh i give up now but I, I have got yes two films i want to talk to you about yeah just because and then we've got to get on to your book because the first film i want to talk to you about i don't know if it's the worst film i've ever seen in my life hopefully it's not one of mine or <laughs> do you know i've been what i watched power of the dog operation mince me the king's speech lion rabbit proof fence oh my god uh, yeah you are a legend uh so i don't know if this film is the worst film or the best film and because you are who you are, you're going to tell me. Mm -hmm. uh, Monrovia by Frederick Wiseman. I don't know that movie. He's the, the guy who does observational documentaries. He did the New York Library. Ah. It's three hours long. And it, it, I'm it, not a massive documentary. Ah, well, I, I need to watch a lot more documentaries. So, so, so this is... So I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I didn't, I, That's but, fine. But, no, so, no, so he's 93. There's no narration. Yeah. There's no arc. Yeah. Monrovia is a town in Indiana. It's three hours, the Sydney Film Festival, and I'm sitting watching this, and it's and it's a it's it's a wheat field, and the wheat's blowing back and forth, and then you cut to a council meeting, and they're arguing about where to put the town bent. It's so boring, it's offensive, but after an hour, you sort of surrender, and then there's a picture of cows in a field for three. And, and I, I don't, I don't know what I'm watching, but I think I might be in the presence of genius. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard to know. I mean, you know, but that's when you know you're in the hands of somebody, yes. a, a filmmaker. Uh, of whatever genre of movie who can sort of hold you in a mm. place of comfort. I mean, I know that there's this movement in some of the, one of the Scandinavian countries, there's something called slow television. Yes, you you know, it's a slow film. Exactly. Sit that. on a train <laughs> and experience. Now, I don't know if that's the hands of greatness or that's just a sort of lazy, lazy or a, a different sort of comfort, comfort entertainment. But it does, it does feed into a different part of your brain to a lot of the stuff, particularly my kids are watching things that are so quick. Yes. You know, I think we also have a need for things that are slow at times. If you're in the hands of someone who knows how to hold you there. Well, that's a great link to the second film I wanted mm -hmm. to just briefly mention because I am embarrassed mm. and I want this is confession, mm. confession with a meal. I want you to make me feel better. Mm. Uh, I have, I've never seen any Marvel film. I've got mm. no interest in any. I mean, I'm sure it's lovely. I've got just literally no interest in that stuff, right? Uh, but dragged kicking and screaming to see the latest Top Gun. Yes. I loved it. Yeah. Why? Well, what's wrong with me? I came out and said, that was great. Yeah. Because it was just simple. It was... I, I saw the grey man. I thought this, that's possibly worse than Monrovia. Just like mm. random explosions, and I don't care. And it just, it just it was sort of anger making, makingly bad. Yeah. And and then I saw Top Gun. Think I actually really enjoyed that. I, I, I yeah. Good on you. And and the good guys won and all that stuff. And it is. It's not whatever genre of film or television you're in. It's really hard to make something good. And. I confess um, I didn't get through Grey Man entirely, um, <laughs> but Top Gun was a sensation because it was the best version of itself. Right. Okay. You felt like you were watching the best version of Spectacle and you were so in the experience of, the, of, of Tom Cruise and the lead characters that you came out of it and you went, only cinema can provide me with that experience. And I did see it at the cinema, which I haven't gone yeah. as much as I'd like to. I'm sure a lot of people like that lately. Yeah. But going with my whole family, uh, yeah. yeah. And Cin me, popcorn and sitting there thinking, you know, stay low else the, the Sams will get you. And, yeah. and at the end, there was this cliched scene and I didn't mind, whatever she's called, the, 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 the love interest. And she's leaning against a nice Porsche. And, yeah. and you go, I'm happily being manipulated. 
that's that's I mean that's what the essence of the business is is to manipulate in a way that feels truthful. Yes, that you feel like you're not being pushed, that you you lean into it. And good uh, good films and television does that. I mean, I think these films, these four quadrant films, as they're called, that you know these massive budget movies that do appeal to every demographic, have to provide a sort of experience of spectacle that takes you beyond what you've experienced before. So being spectacle is a key part of its offering, and I think, wow, Top Gun did manage to achieve that. So I, I'm just, I just have to, just, it's so nice talking to you. I could do another podcast just talking about film, but one other film that I wasn't going to mention, but um, have you seen Lars and the Real Girl? Many years ago, yeah. Isn't that brilliant? I've got, I'm the, yeah, my kids have read that book as well. But Ryan Gosling, he plays a bloke who lives with a sex doll. Yeah. Yet it's a great film. Yet it's not trivial, it's not... It's it's thoughtful and moving. And yeah. So I, I, I just I, I envy you your career. Huh. Here we go. Your your book on five of my life. You have chosen a book with a hilarious uh, cover quote, which is one of the smartest books of all time. And I read every page of it, and I've got three pages of notes here. It's uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, famous for The Black Swan. This book, though, is fooled by randomness. Utterly, utterly, mind-meltingly brilliant. Uh, tell us when you read it and why you've chosen it on Five My Life. I'm a bit intimidated because I haven't read it for so many years. But again, you asked me and this came to <laughs> mind. So I'm sure you know a lot more about it than I do. But it was a book that defined a moment for me because I, I studied a lot of cultural theory and philosophy and stuff at university, including law. But then I moved very swiftly into the world of film and television. And all those ideas based sort of um, subjects came in handy. And I bring a lot of it to the work I do. But you know, I'm in the business of trying to make stuff happen, trying to make stuff. And it's like moving things forward every day. And at a certain point, about 15 years ago, I started rekindling my interest in the sort of world of ideas. And this was the book that turned that light switch on again for me. And since then, I've become, you know, I'm, I'm sort of the opposite of most people. My day job is is watching film and television and looking at scripts and, and casting tapes and edits. And my night, um, I read uh, boring books on philosophy and economics and ah. psychology. And... Um, <laughs> And then have sort of channeled that into the podcast. But this book just has such a brilliant premise, you know, again, one of those light bulb moments where you realize that so much around you is actually randomness, yeah. is random. Meaning doesn't lie in so much stuff. And we are fooled constantly, as the title said, by that random distribution of events. And whether it's looking at, you know, fund management performance and you go, oh, they perform well for three years in a row, they must know what they're doing. You need to just stop and go, hold on. There's a natural random distribution of outcomes in so much of life, certainly in the stock market performance. And what makes you believe, you have to then ask the question, what makes you believe that that's not random? And it's become a lens of mine. What makes me believe it's not random? And when I'm looking at film or television show and whether it's worked, something that we've done or hasn't worked, it's easy to say, you know, you want to go back and you want to work out what you did and didn't do right. But let's also just realize that there was just a lot of random stuff. You know, you get great writers, directors, uh, casts, you get a great story. They don't often work out. That doesn't mean you made a bad decision. It can just sometimes be the randomness of how things come together. So knowing what's random and what is truly meaningful is, is something that I find a sort of exciting prism. Well, well, I'm enormously grateful to you for getting me into that book. What did you like about it? Oh, my word. The, the, the central thesis about uh, the role of luck. Yeah. We did a, um, in, in, I've got a consultancy we, when we interviewed high net worth individuals for a, for a bank. And one of the questions we asked them is, what do you contribute your success to? Mm. And 88% of them said hard work. Oh. And, and, you, and you know, God, God bless their little cotton socks. And you go, I'm, I'm sure you do work hard, mate. But if you were born in Syria, you'd probably be dead or disabled. Not, you, you know, I know you're very clever and you're a hedge fund manager. But, you know, luck had a large slice. And also, you're clever now. But if there's a stock market crash and you've gone long on crypto or whatever it is, you'll be, yeah. you'll be you know, tomorrow's, what, what is it? Uh, today's rooster is tomorrow's feather duster or whatever else. So, and uh, we had James Valentin on, you know, the, yes. the, the, he's a lovely chap, the, the radio bloke. And uh, he chose the producers. Yeah, right. Uh, and uh, that film, I had laughing. Springtime for Hitler in Germany. Everything about it is wrong. It's, it involves 
Hitler and this. It's just a, you, you couldn't make it worse. And the fat bloke in it, uh, the, the wonderful line for me is, where did it all go right? Yeah. <laughs> you go, that's, you're trying to make a hit. Yeah, he's casting Hitler and Hitler there, and it's a smash Broadway. But I just love it. So, so luck. I'm probably not amazed, but I'm saddened to hear that so many of these great hedge fund managers and these top <laughs> people still believe that <laughs> their hard work's 88%. You know, it's just not recognizing reality, isn't no. it? It's a sort of blindness where your ego just gets in the way of seeing how the world works. Yeah. And uh, hard work's important, but uh, but wow, you're sort of hard work in a world of, of luck is the world we're in. So, so you asked what I like about it. So just to give you a, it's your view of the book, not mine, but I love thing. Hindsight bias, um, it's easy to predict the past. Yeah. Isn't that fabulous? So you look at it and you go, yes, it was obvious the 1929 crash was going to happen. You go, well, it was obvious now. Yeah. But if you were living in 1928, you know, but you wouldn't have done it. Uh, the other one is the social treadmill effect. Yeah. Okay, so you're a successful film producer, blah, blah, blah. But if you move to the Hamptons and you're living next to Steven Spielberg, so you feel slightly less successful. Yeah. Than, than you, so you're now a failure. because. Yeah. So, you, yeah. <laughs> so you just, I love the philosophy of enoughness. Uh, again, I write about this, but where he says, we know how to live. Mm. it's execution that matters. Mm. Somerset Maughan said, uh, the important truths are too important to be new. Mm. So how about we stop looking for the latest bloody shortcut answer and actually try and implement? Well, Nicholas Taleb is very big on the classics, on going back to the great books. He's, he is pompous. He's, that's probably his least pompous book. They've become more pompous. But his insights are extraordinary because he comes from this background as a financial trader, and a sort of philosopher and a man of letters. And in the end of the day, he's interested in your skin in the game. And he wrote a book called Skin yes, in the Game. Yeah. And he's like, you know, we can have all these theories, behavioral economics and biases and everything. But in the end of the day, you know what's real when you've got when you've got you know money in the game as a trader. And humans are designed to be able to essentially make good decisions when they've actually got skin in the I'm game. I'm so glad you mentioned that that book because he, the notion that, that I've thought before that book, but the notion where there were people agitating in the state, which I, I really genuinely, profoundly believe and wish would happen, is you can't vote for a war unless one of your children yeah, right. has to fight in, the, in the teeth arm. And yeah. you go, yeah, I mean, yes. So, yeah. so I'm, I'm, we're going to go to war against whoever and Alex and Harry are going to be in the front yeah. line. You go, oh, could we do a bit, a bit more talking? Yeah. Because <laughs> you know, one of my sons might die. Yeah. 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 Oh, well, you are nailing it with your choices, mate. You, your song, we're moving to 2014. You have chosen a soul-crushingly beautiful song by a band from Cincinnati in America, The National. And the song is I Need My Girl. I keep feeling smaller and smaller The National is, in a sense, my perfect band. I grew up and I listened a lot to classical music. I was probably not the most um, cool kid, let's just put it uh, mildly. But as I got more into, you know, rock and all the different sorts of music there are, I think I brought that interesting classical, there's this sort of world of post-minimalist composers who do a lot of stuff for film. And, and Bryce Dessner, who's one of the musicians, members of the National, was actually one of the great contemporary classical composers. But it just combines this sort of melancholy, beautiful, uh, soulful uh, singing. Words are not really... I don't really listen to lyrics much. I'm not sure if you're a big ah, lyrics person, but no, I don't tend oh, not to listen oh, to lyrics but, but too much. now you tell me. So I, <laughs> I have no idea what he's oh, on about. Oh, no, mate. I thought you were going <laughs> to crap on about Caroline. And I was going to have all these questions about how did you meet your wife. Uh, so you've chosen I Need My Girl, and it's not about well, needing your partner. Well, yeah, yes and no. I just had my 50th birthday, and I had the great privilege. I had a band uh, playing, playing music at it, and I took my guitar, and I sang her with this band... <laughs> I need my girl well, there you to go. her. So yes, I, I used the song for, Are you still for married? good. And I'm still married. <laughs> and it was one of the, I mean, I, you just realize what a powerful thing it is to be a singer with a band around you. Oh. I don't know how those people manage to stay sane. It's just incredibly powerful. But this band, The National, just has, you know, there's a the, the producer, Aaron Desner, who's another musician there and Bryce's brother, produces 
it's these in, just incredibly complex syncopated rhythms. It combines so many different things that come together. And for me, you know, it's hard to define music, isn't it? Some things just light up your insides and some don't. And for me, I listen to this music and I go, uh, you know, this is my band. Was it, was it Elvis Costello said that writing about music is like dancing about architecture? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't. Gosh, I... I recommend to all the people listening to this that they check out all three of your first choices because the, the, they were just a delight to to listen to and and it made me sort of want to call Kate and tell her I love her mm. what's the one the film about um uh, it's been remade in Australia about the sheep so two sheep yeah, farmers ra- are, ra- rams i mean and, and i i came out and i called my brother in england yeah and i just said john mate i i love you just- well narratives are powerful aren't they and we've had so many great moments over i mean the power of a film like The King's Speech, you know, did really well. But I, I was flicking through an old, you know, memory book and there was a little note from someone who had decided not to kill themselves. Wow. Having watched that movie because wow. they felt like st- their stutter that was, you know, causing them just massive psychological pain was not the end of the world. And, you know, you can actually have a really profound effect. So we really are incredibly conscious to choose stories that we think will at least bring something, you know, something yeah. soothing to people's difficulties or shine a light on a social issue that might have been avoided or or back storytellers who might not have had their stories back previously. It, even though we've had some success in our company, it is so hard, Nigel, to get anything made, to get anything financed. It's a miracle. And every time we have a TV show or film made, I still... Inside me is there's still the 25 year old who's just starting out with a you know first few things going. This is a miracle. I, I treat them like miracles each time. I, I read the story about one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Yeah. Go with that list of talent that the original text. I mean everything about that says well that was going to be made you know in six months because why yeah. not? And, and you go 12 years. Yeah. And what people don't realize is sort of quite interesting. Whenever you see a movie, whoever's listening to this. Imagine that every actor or actress in it is the seventh choice. (laughs) Because that's probably close to the reality. (laughs) No, we will never admit which one. Yeah, yeah. But there is a whole world. People look at it and go, well, it can't be that hard. But everything in there has been worked on. The script is the 17th draft. You know, you've gone to seven actors beforehand. Four directors have fallen out. Um, The finance has fallen through twice, including once you've started shooting. It's it's a really... um, Hairy ride. So, in your chosen film on Five My Life, um, Clint Eastwood was the was the first choice, and Sergio couldn't get him. Right. And so, so now I look at it and go, "That's Bronson." But exactly what you said, you go, "Yeah, yeah. he was tearing his hair out because Clint was playing hard to get, and then said no." And back to your quote from Nicholas Taleb that we, you know, we read meaning into the past. We look at whoever's cast the seventh person. And we go, it was made for them. We justify, we say, we cannot imagine anyone else doing this role. And we believe it because yeah. in, the, in the end of the day, what's beautiful is what's on screen. That's the movie. The script is really important. It's the blueprint for the next stage, which is the footage, which is the blueprint for the edit, which is where you make the film again and you re-record dialogue and do whatever yeah. to make a story. And then it's sold on and then it becomes the, the public's. And at a certain point, you've got to let your baby go. Now, fourth choice on five my life is always the place and and you've chosen where i had dinner last night mate and met one of your friends um the icebergs well probably not the dinner place i'm in the pool here right or one level above which is the gym and and the little cafe there and it's just an incredible place to be i'm not a big swimmer in the sense i'm not i don't surf i don't do some of the more crazy uh, end-to-end swimming ocean swimming that happens at the moment particularly after covid but the older i get the more i just appreciate the australian ocean and beach i'm really lucky to live not too far away it's become a big part of my life and i think just traveling overseas to to being in a city like london or even in new york manhattan where there's no horizon You know, you just realize that everywhere you turn, you're looking at a building that's, you know, best case 30 meters away. And just to be at the edge of a continent and to be able to look out, you know, back to our conversation about slow television and film, uh, the slowest form is nature, of course. And there's so much fast stuff happening from social media and, you know, some of the things my kids are watching on TikTok. I'm not a big TikTok watcher, but... They're, they're actually extraordinary at being able to absorb so much information so quickly. I'm sure I can more than, or we can, our, our generation faster than, than our parents. But the speed of information absorption is, is extraordinary. At the same time, it's just really nice sometimes to let nature 
slow things down and to be in a place like that. And I've started enjoying cold water, winter swimming, and um, it's just, uh, you know, it's a key place in my life. It's a source of almost guilty embarrassment to me that I am lucky enough to yeah. live on the seaboard uh, of Sydney. Uh, I mean, I, I do ocean swimming. If, mm. if you are in the ocean and you're looking out to sea, mm. well, by definition, you can't see any buildings because yeah. it's New Zealand is next. Yeah. And, and yeah. so so you, you can be in a big city, yet by turning, you know, 90 degrees, you are just in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. And if you get your head wet, oh, I, I just, uh, yeah, I adore it. So I suppose, what, what a spot. Yeah. It is, and you don't take it for granted. There's something about nature at its best which you don't get bored of whereas there's so much else material possessions where you know you can sort of factor them in very quickly and sort of need something more but there's nothing more you need when you look out the ocean it sort of replenishes itself pretty endlessly and I go to the gym down there sometimes and uh you know that view out from from that gym is um yeah you, you know you wouldn't trade it for anything the fifth choice on five of my life is my favorite <laughs> because people tend to get quite personal and uh, I, they make me laugh when the things they choose and they're strained. Rob Carlton chose a stick. Charlie Teo chose his own book. Um, Peter Fitzsimons chose a Tesla. And you, I love this. I can't wait to hear what on earth you are going on about because you have chosen a comic book celebrating Peanuts' 30 years. Pe not Peanuts, the, the, the food stuff. Peanuts, the comic, I imagine. Yeah, it's a bit random. I found this one the hardest. I couldn't think of a possession that I felt somehow deserved a place I don't know, um, maybe not tethered enough to my possessions, but this is a book, 60 year celebration of Peanuts uh, with all, pretty much all the comics in there over the 60 years. It's an enormous book. My sister got it for me uh, when I turned 40. And, you know, we, we had just have a fantastic relationship. We used to fight all the time as kids. And now she's one of my closest uh, confidants. So... You know, do, do, do you have good. lots of siblings? Or I've just got one. Ah, uh, uh, okay. Right. So it does make me feel good with my kids and hopefully people out there as well that, you know, how you get on in the beginning doesn't necessarily foretell uh, what happens in the future. But Peanuts cartoons, Snoopy cartoons, as I call them, have just randomly been a big part of my life since I was little. My mother was a bit of a, a, a literary snob. She was a doctorate in French literature and we used to talk about books a lot. And this was the one comic strip that she sort of allowed in the right. house. <laughs> okay. um, so I would go back to it uh, as a kid. And it was a mainstay, my sister as well. Um, it's always stayed around through my life as a sort of comfort food. Uh, and then randomly with my three boys, each individually, and I can't convince them to do anything else that I want them to do, but they've all just adopted um, these comic strips. And I think there's something special about them. You know, the, the humor, the characters sort of dissection and insights into human nature, the, the whimsy, the poetry there. There are amazing movies that Disney, Pixar make and all these other big companies, but there's something in those movies that celebrate the triumph of the human spirit, which is amazing. But the beautiful thing about Snoopy cartoons is that they sort of celebrate the less easy emotions, the, the failures, the unsolvable parts of reality. And they, they, they do comfort you. They bring a poetic consolation to the everyday and somehow you know that's comforting and and yeah i just return to them all the time so it's a special book for me for all those reasons are they still being created new or is or is it is it over like faulted towers is it no it's it's well they're over as comic strips but i'm pretty sure that disney through fox bought the rights to all the peanuts cartoons and so they've just created a whole bunch of new ones on television but I didn't grow up watching them. I just grew up reading them. That's right. So they're sort of an evening, um, intimate moment. For me, my, my peanuts would be Winnie the Pooh. The, the language in Winnie the Pooh is amazing, isn't it? Oh, you we, just, it's so incredibly witty. And you sort of forget that old books have as much reason to be incredibly insightful and witty as new things. It's not. It's, it speaks to you like today. And, and incredibly ahead of its time, where, where, where Eeyore was having a bad day with capital H, capital A. And yeah. we're talking about depression and all, you, you know, before, you know, that had been invented, you know, it's just ahead of its time. Have you ever come across a book called The Tao of Pooh? No, but that a, sounds right up my street. It, it, it's some, I would think it was in my 20s again, but it's a sort of book of explaining Taoism 
through the lens of Winnie the Pooh, and Winnie the Pooh being the great sort of Taoist character wow. of equanimity and uh, well, and then, well, having read going a, with the flow, a, a fool by randomness that, that's three hundred pages of dense philosophical thing. <laughs> I'm going to go and check that one out. <laughs> and mate, so. you have been such a delight to chat to. But there is a surprise question. Yes, who would you like to hear on Five of My Life next, and why? Well, the first person that comes to mind, and I challenge you to try to get her on, it would be fantastic, is Jane Campion, who's right. a writer-director. Uh, I worked with her on, on Top of the Lake and on The Power of the Dog. And she's an extraordinary person. She is definitely a collaborator and partner who's had a massive impact on my life. She just sees the world, speaking of the Tao of Pooh, she has a way of turning things around and understanding who you are and who everyone is, and sort of cutting through everything in a way that, that can be incredibly disarming. You certainly can't uh, bullshit her. And I'd be really curious to know what she comes up with. Your face sort of lit up when you were talking about her. That's, that's such a wonderful recommendation. She, she made my wife's favourite film, hmm. uh, The Piano. Yeah. She has but, a way of seeing the world that is unique and incredibly authentic at the same time. So it feels like something that resonates, but not anything you've seen before. And, you know, that's rare. Uh, Emil Sherman, thank you for sharing your five on Five of My Life. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you follow Five of My Life, you might enjoy my latest book, Smart, Stupid and Sixty. In it, I write about a number of the issues discussed on the show. It's the 20-year follow-on from my first book, Fat, Forty and Fired. If you have any feedback on the book or suggestions for the show, please get in touch via my website, nigelmarsh.com.